come back. Sorry, everybody. Timed out with that one. There we go. Good. <clears throat> so I was right in the middle of carving the bowl on this. Um, and then I ran out of time. And then I also realized that it was time to walk the puppy, who you can see in the background there. Um, and uh, so I'm going to finish this. Um, and then I'm going to start its pair. Um, one of the things I can see from looking at this now is that this edge right here needs to be pulled in just a smidge tighter. One of the things that happens when one side is not pulled in as tightly as, it, as, as the other is that it can make the other side appear bigger than it actually is. And this can be balanced out by pulling in this side um, and that will go a long way towards making this more symmetrical. But I could also futz a little bit more and pull in uh, this corner as well, just a tiniest bit. Usually try not to, try to have all that done, but sometimes I will admit when you are carving the bowl, you'll realize that based on how the, um, based on how the bowl is working out, you'll realize some things about symmetry that it was harder to see until the bowl was there. Um, so for these cuts, because I'm doing some tight curves at the neck, I'm actually going to use a different knife than what I was using before. This is a, a mora that has not had its bevel reduced at all, or widened at all. There's some snow off the roof. It's okay. It's okay, Will. It's just snow off the roof. Um, and so that means that the, the tip here is, is uh, thinner. It has a thinner point, and so it can cur twist its way out of uh, tighter curves than my main one. Um, okay, so that's that curve. And then this curve, we're gonna just do it that way. And then just a little bit that way. So you know, while I said that I try to always do everything and then do the bowl last, the proof is always in the pudding. And you gotta do what you gotta do to make the spoon as good as it can be. So. Um, somebody asked about meeting the puppy. Let's see if I, once I get this done, I might pull the phone from the tripod and just hold it up to the cage so you guys can meet her if you like. I'm not going to let her out of the cage because I'm training her to expect that when I'm carving, she's in the cage. Um, because I don't want her jumping up on me while I'm using a knife. Um, and I also don't quite know yet how much of the wood chips that she's chewing on she's actually eating. Um, I'm fine with dogs chewing on wood chips, but until it's clear to me that she's not eating them, I just want to go slow with that. Of course, there's always wood chips floating around my house, even though I sweep. Um, so she has access to wood chips. All right, so just sweeten up the lines on the outside there a little bit. And that just requires that I refine the back just a little bit. And again, I want to do all of this because once I'm doing the bowl, I want to know that whatever depth I achieve in the bowl is going to work for the finished dimensions of the spoon. I don't want to do a depth in the bowl and then realize that I went a little too far and I didn't realize it because the back was thicker than it was going to be. And Okay, so now I'm back where I was earlier. 
getting everything smoothed out and as even as I can make it. And now, turn to the hook knife. So what I was saying when this cut out was that because this is uh, a shallower bowl than I typically do for really anything else, uh, I need to be careful myself to not overcut and cut down through it. Um, and really that's just a matter of being cautious. But what I want to do is calibrate my cut so that I'm approaching that finished rim size as I'm also approaching the finished depth. You guys have a good angle on this? Yeah, we do. So. And I'm also, the other thing that's happening is that as this is approaching finished rim size, it's also becoming its most delicate. So I want to make sure that I'm doing everything and not leaving one area that needs a lot of heavy lifting at the very end because I want to do everything evenly because if heavy lifting with carving usually involves squeezing the wood in various ways as you stabilize it. And I've actually crushed eating bowls in my hand before. Um, hey, EJ. Uh, by needing to do too much of an aggressive cut at the end when it was at its most delicate. So this is the time where I want to sort of get everything to the same level of delicacy now so that as I get closer and closer to that finished delicate rim that I want in a salad server, um, I don't have any tough pulls like that that I'm doing at the end. I want to just be skimming around very gently, easing things down. So I'm trying now, there we go, to get basically everything to what could be a finished surface and then I'll just keep swirling that finished surface larger and larger and cleaner and cleaner until I'm right where I want to be and then I can stop and I'll know I'm right where I want to be because I can feel it. There's a certain delicacy that I can feel um, which is another reason why I like to do the bowls last because if the back of the bowl is accurate to where you want it to be then you can feel when you're at that magical point at which the delicacy is just right. Um, but if you haven't done the back, you don't know where that is and you might end up um, cutting too deep of a bowl or a deeper bowl than, than you would have wished. Um, So now I'm looking at this here and trying to make sure the rim on this side is the same as the rim on this side. And as you can see, I need to cut more on this side, which I'm doing just like this. Voila. Now that is about finished rim thickness on salad servers. Uh, daily wood carving, this is cherry. I carve almost exclusively cherry. I do carve some birch and walnut occasionally and maybe a little bit of maple, but uh, I have so much good cherry that cherry for me is the perfect combination of a nice, crisp knife finish easily and um, but still being softer to carve than something else that would give you a crisp knife finish uh, like a beach or um, apple or other things that would give you a clean slick finish are generally harder on your knives, harder on your hands. Cherry is that sweet spot for me of in between. And it also has the benefit of I have access to very large logs of it and I prefer to carve very large logs. Uh, it's been sitting around uh, as a downed tree for the last year and then I just bucked it into rounds uh, a week or two ago and so it has been relaxing within the log and so it won't do nearly as much warping as it would if it were truly green and I can also carve it start to finish in one go without having to wait for it to dry out. A lot of woods if you try carving them when they're really truly green the 
wood fibers are so soft that your knife is uh, tearing some of them. There's no way around it. It just will, no matter how sharp your knife is. Although the duller your knife, the more tear you get. And so by letting it dry out, you're letting it harden up. And then you can go back and actually get a clean cut by truly cutting and severing those fibers. And you'll get a much smoother finish. Well, with this cherry that's been sitting around for a while, it's already dried out to the point where you can see the difference between the stuff that's dried because it's been exposed to air for a few seconds and stuff that still has m enough moisture in it that I can feel it. It's damp. Um, so it allows me to get a really crisp finish with a log right from the, right from the start without having to wait for it to, um, to dry out. Um, and then it also won't warp as much as when you carve something green which I really appreciate because I really like long straight lines um, and it's very frustrating to me when you carve something and then it dries and you spend all that time trying to get it straight. Um, but I wish you guys could feel this now. It's, it, it is at that appropriate level um, except for right up here. I find that a lot of times here is the last part to actually get thin enough and clean enough. Um, and I think it's because the way that you get this part is by doing straight cuts down from here. And it's just until you do those cuts that pull down from the tip of the bowl down into the center, you just never quite carve that center, middle, front edge of the bowl truly thin enough. And it will end up being flatter than the rest. Um, and you feel that. I mean, if this were an eating spoon, you'd feel it immediately, but you also just feel it when you're running it through your hands. Um, you know, you want an even thickness or a thickness that tapers evenly from an area that's thinner to an area that's thicker. So again, I'm now that I have the outside rim the way I want it, I want that bevel to be uniform and just the right size. I do different sized rims for different types of spoons. Um, a cooking spoon will have a thicker rim because you're scraping it. Um, whereas a salad server like this, you want basically as thin a rim as you can realistically get. And on eating spoons, you can even have what I call rimless, where uh, you basically are pulling this inside face right up to the bevel that runs along the outside edge, that defines the outside edge. Um, How's Matt's knife? I love Matt's knife. I can do stuff with Matt's knife that I, I couldn't do with the knife I had before. Um, so yeah, I, I can't recommend Matt's work highly enough. It's been amazing to see him develop as a tool maker over the last couple months. Um, and the knives he's producing now are really spectacular. And the man's attention to detail is tremendous. So uh, to my mind, it's the way to go. Um, uh, now the one thing I will say about uh, a rimless spoon is that it doesn't photograph nearly as well, um, like not even close to nearly as well. It's just something about that rim that just makes the whole shape pop. And so I've gone back to having a very tiny rim, largely just so that it photographs as as well as it actually looks and functions. It's a, it's a middle ground I'm trying to walk here um, to make stuff that people want to buy in a, in a, from a photo format, um, but also have it work as well as it possibly can work. Um, and that's an instance where those two are oddly enough at odds. Okay, so now Good, good, good. Now I'm just feeling for any spots that might be thicker, lumpier, showing up as being slightly torn and not freshly cut. As they dry out, that will show up easily. And the nice thing about cherry is you wait 30 seconds and those marks will show up. So now I'm just going around and I think 
We're there. Yes, Brian, we're back. Um, all right, uh, I promised Brian that I'd hold the camera down where you guys can see Willa. It's rather boring right now. Um, don't want to touch the thing that makes it stop. It's rather boring right now because she's just asleep. There she is. You good girl. You're doing very well. Okay. There it is. Your puppy fix for the day. Okay, good. <clears throat> right, the Bob Ross show. Uh... Uh, yeah, I failed to save the previous one on YouTube because when I ended it, I didn't save it and such is life. So I will save this one when I'm done. Still getting used to that whole technology thing. So the last thing I'm going to do before I burnish it is you see how this doesn't quite match this. And even more to the point, there's a very, there's a tiny bump on this one and there's a little more of a bump on this one. So... Again, I'm gonna use that Mora that has the true Mora grit so it twists a little better um, out of the cut. And I'm gonna just do a tiny little bit. And then I'll go to the other side. Just clean up that curve. and. In terms of bang for your buck, cleaning up these curves at the end is one of the best things you can do for improving the appearance of your spoon with very little effort. Um, there we go, nicely cleaned up. If you came to cross spoons, you get famous playing with your puppy. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be a good perk, man. That should be what I do on the TV show. Carving with I should have a puppy there. All right, so this one is done. This one has still to be done. And you can see the difference in the finished thing from the blank. And you can see how much wiggle room there is within the blank. Um, now that's just me eyeballing it. That's not using a template or anything. Um, and you can see the other thing you can see is I left myself enough room at the bottom for when it lines up nicely on the top. So, uh, and then the other thing I want to be aware of is just, you know, what is it doing in terms of the crank and in terms of the depth? Because when you're trying to make a match set, you, you're trying to capture not just the outline, but all of the ways that it feels the way it feels. So, um, so let's do that. Um, okay, let's see here. So one thing I want to do when you're carving a match set and you uh, you can't let the line wiggle around that much on the second one, right? On the first one, you can sort of have it be what it's going to be. On the second one, you're trying to match it. So, um, A, you got to make your peace with the fact that it's not going to match perfectly. But B, you want to basically get the sweetest shape that you can that matches the other one while leaving as much material for removing later as you can. Um, so there's no, there's nothing to be gained by making it too small at this stage. Much better to make it a little bit too big and then pull it down tight to those final parameters once I get the rim narrower and I can actually make an accurate cut. So at this stage, it's just about smoothing the bumps, getting the rough shape right. And you'll see this with um, You'll see this with uh, all of my spoons. I sort of start off doing things quite roughly, and then the the shape gets more and more refined as I go along. It doesn't, not any one thing gets all the way refined right at the beginning. So, uh, 
Okay, now I've carved around the rough shape uh, like I did on the other one. I did the handle on a spoon mule and it's not perfectly straight, although it's better than the last one. And I want to leave it for now because when I go to redraw the shape, I might need to cock the handle one way or the other um, based on, I don't know, what needs to happen with the bowl. So I want to leave myself options. Um, if anybody has any questions on doing this, let me know. They don't have to be related to what I'm doing. They can be related to other parts of the spoon making process or the business side of things or what I do with my life other than this. It doesn't really matter. Happy to talk about anything. So now I just very roughly did these neck transitions. All I'm trying to do is just clean them up enough that I can approach them later. And now I can see that, even if you're just putting down your knife for a second, cover it up. So I can see that with this one, I have a very subtle curve this way. Now this one, just from chance, has a subtle curve the opposite way. See how it has an arch there. So that's probably the first thing I want to address because how much I can push down this arch without making it too thin is going to define what I need to do down here to get the angle roughly the same as the angle here, if you see what I mean. Do you do mostly handles on the spoon mule or also the bowl as well, depending on the spoon? Um, so the I only do long handles on the spoon mule. I find that it's just uh, it's, it's an easy way to get... Um, uh, the spoon mule is a nice way to get clean lines on a fairly long straight handle. Um, I do the sides and then I do the back and then I do the front coming down and then I flip it over and I do the back of the bowl somewhat. And largely what I'm doing with the back of the bowl is not trying to get anything perfect because I haven't defined the top of the bowl so I don't want to do too much. But rather what I'm trying to do is just remove some of this weight so that I can more quickly um, uh, do it with the knife later and that it's not as choppy as the axe would be. Um, that's really all I'm trying to do with the mule. I know there are some people who do the top rim with the draw knife and all that. I find that I can get shapes that I prefer by using the knife rather than using the mule. The mule imposes certain straight a certain straightness to things that I haven't found a way past that feels good to me. Okay, so like I said, I'm doing the top of the handle first, trying to get a little more of a sweep into it this way so that it matches the other one. Um, hey, thanks about the knife. Yeah, this is a, a knife I had Matt make me with the handle that I like so much. Um, and this handle is made from a piece of redwood driftwood that I uh, picked up when I was in California as a kid. And uh, I've been carrying it around with me for ages thinking I should make something of it. And so I sent it to Matt and asked him to make me uh, a knife handle from it. And so it's great. It's nice that it has that memory for me of being a kid. <clears throat> okay. So let's see what sort of curve I can get. And I'm also sort of feeling the grain and paying attention to if it continues to want to be cut that way. Because the grain will always tell you just before it starts to tear that it's not happy being cut and that it wants to tear. So if you're cutting slowly enough that you can stop in time, then you can just pay attention to the way the blade of the knife feels in the wood and handle whatever situation you need to handle. So. Okay, that is about as thin 
as I dare to make it. And you can see that I have put a slight concaveness to it, um, which will be, once I pull this up back here, it'll be more exaggerated. Um, now, okay, so now that I know what that is going to be, this one, let's just compare. This one has quite a thin handle and it even swoops in to the bowl. Um, so I want to have that one do the same. Okay, that's good. So now I need to define this top rim. Um, so that it matches this other one. And this is really why it takes longer to do two truly matched salad servers is that you have to pay attention to, unless it's a set, unless you're doing every aspect exactly the same, which I rarely do, um, you have to pay attention to all of these little details of how does the neck approach the handle, how does the handle handle, you know, what shape does the handle have, all that stuff that I let vary from spoon to spoon within my larger shape categories. If you want to make a match set for a salad servers, you have to match all those details. And in general, I try and let the wood dictate those details. So when I'm making salad servers and all of a sudden I'm trying to dictate it back to the wood, you just have to pay extra careful attention and make choices that are gonna work out in the long run. So you can see, yeah, particularly on this side, that I've now got the curve that I want very shallow curve. And then on this side, oh, but it needs to come down just a little bit on this side. Spoon carving is like 40% just holding the spoon up and looking at it from the different angles. And it'll tell you what it needs to do. You just have to train your eye to see what needs to happen. Good, puppy's out of sleep. Okay, so now you can see looking down the back there that these are basically even, close enough at this stage, and that the rim is has an even camber with the handle here. So that's what you're looking for. And the trick is to be able to see it while all of this other stuff is distracting you by not being lined up with it. Um, so now now I'm going to pull the back of the handle up, just in case that's a limiting factor, and I need to make sure it's exactly the way it's going to be. So I want to do not much back here in this thin section, and then increase the strength here. So I'm going to do a brace my arm on my forearm and actually pull the spoon back towards myself. And that way I can really ah, lean into that cut. I could also do it with a thumb push. But since it's um, since I'm going for a straight line, this is a nice way to get a nice clean line. Okay, good. So now I've got that the way I want it, and now I'm gonna define the underside of that swoop the bottom because again with a salad server you're gonna oh, call coming in I don't know who that calls from dismiss that um, with a salad server you're holding it you know like this you're pro you might be holding it like this but you also might be holding it like this so um, either way the the curved outside needs to match roughly match the curve of whatever bowl you're intending it to be used um, and while I certainly have eaten salads out of steep, steep-sided small bowls. It seems like a lot of people use a broader, shallower bowl. So I'm going for a broader, shallower sweep here. Um, yeah, salad server isn't a situation where you want a whole lot of crank in the spoon. Now, interesting. So one thing that's happening back here if you're gonna be able to see that. You see those two streaks right there? 
those are some hairline cracks. Hi, Pernima. Um, those are some hairline cracks, and it's really unclear how far they go in. I don't think it's very far because I'm not seeing any evidence of them here, and they don't go all the way out to the rim. So it must just be some fracture within the wood, I think. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely a fracture because you can see you can see it in the chip itself. You see how it's it's bent right there. So all of a sudden, this becomes the limiting factor. I, I have to carve that away until it's gone. So now that the ticket is carving until those fractures are completely eliminated, and then we'll see where we're at once that's done. Interesting. Let's see. salvage it might not be okay go down below that one yeah we're reaching the point where I might not be able to save this um, in which case y'all are just gonna have to come out with me to the greenhouse and we'll make a new one um, so you can see what I'm looking at is that line right there that's a crack that goes down into it um, so sometimes you get lucky and you can eliminate that but it appears this is not one of those times. Let's just see what it would take to get down below it. I reduced the thickness quite a bit. Okay. Oh, I'm so close. Am I? Hmm. I might have gotten it. Hold on. Yeah, so all so all I have now, so what I've been trying to do is carve down into this. Basically pull this shoulder down, that's where the crack was, and see if by the time I eliminated it, if I still had a usable shape here. Now remember, this is going to be carved down probably a quarter inch all around. So that's going to dramatically uh, fatten up this edge. So I don't have to worry about this edge being terribly thin. Um, what I'm waiting for now is for that effect of the cherry to happen where it dries out and shows me where it's torn instead of cut. Because I think I have just one tiny little spot, but it doesn't look like a crack that's going any deeper. It looks like the, the end of a crack. So I might have successfully resolved this. We'll see. Either way, if I'm waiting, I can reduce the back of this neck to make it match and start pulling the weight down on this shoulder here. I think this might have been a salvage. That's always nice when you can do that. So again, these big cuts are made by an aggressive thumb push and then a pivot at the end. Um, so I think when you get cracks like that, 
It has to do with. Uh, it has to do with a, a an inner crack within a piece of wood, which is interesting because of the two blanks, this one came from a much sketchier, gnarlier piece of wood, and this one came from a very solid looking piece of wood. So you never know. Um, and it doesn't happen very often to me, but when it does, it can be quite frustrating. Um, okay. Reduce the weight on this side. Hi, Brian. Um, okay, so looking at the side as it dries out, it looks like I successfully got underneath the crack that was there. Yep, yeah, I did. Wow. Was not expecting that. I was expecting the opposite. Um, now, part of what saved me was that salad servers are inherently shallow implements, right? Unlike a spoon that's kind of useless if it's too shallow. Um, the salad server itself was going to get reduced in thickness quite a lot anyways. Um, so that gave me the ability to really cut away material that I often don't have. Um, it's it would be much more likely under those circumstances for me to have to scrap the spoon um, from that happening. But luckily enough, it didn't. Yeah, that is the uh, the risk of carving live, man. Is something happens and happens in front of the audience <laughs> you love the sound that sound of the wig going sh through the wood yeah satisfying sound all right okay so now i've got both sides about to equal equal delicacy good you can see, now yeah, I see this side is, is it this side? Yeah, that side's still a little bit fatter. So push that down a little bit more. So push down the middle a little bit more. Hey, happy International Women's Day to everybody. All you women out there, we sure are glad to have you and to have you tolerate us. All right. Everyone go call your moms. Okay. Good. Now, successfully eliminated that problem and at the same time reduced the sides so that now I can draw the shape. Now, given that I'm trying to match the size and delicacy of this one, uh, I need to do a little bit of holding it in place and kind of eyeballing what needs to happen for it to have a similar neck and a similar bowl size and handle. Handle is kind of the easiest one, and we'll leave that handle long for the moment. Um, but basically, I need to make sure that the bowls are lined up with one another. I will, Pranima. Um And so really, what that means is treating this flat spot here, right in the middle, where the curve of the circle is going to touch it, that is the, the weak link, whatever you want to call it. That's the limiting factor. So I'm going to have the circle touch right there, and then it's going to go in and go in from that. So it's worth scrutinizing your situation and figuring out where it is that you absolutely have to leave material there 
Otherwise, you'll get in trouble later down the road. Um, and likewise, in a similar vein, I'm going to leave this neck a little bit thick because I can always pull the neck in quite easily at the end. But if I remove too much right now, I get into trouble later on. So, looks pretty good. Um, I never drew these circles with a compass. I always just freehanded them, and over time they've gotten better um, and more circular. So I think uh, I would not be able to do what I do without a pencil, eyeballing where to take material away and seeing that even as you take the material away. Holding that in your mind is a lot trickier than if you have a line to follow. So now I'm just going to carve around that. And again, if I can, I'm trying to do it in as few cuts as possible. Because every time you start and stop, there's a little bump. So. You want to. There we go. Just like that. Voila. Okay, now I do the other side, the shoulder side. I always do the shoulder side second. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just easier for me to visualize what needs to happen with this one once the top of the bowl is done. And then, like I said, in that neck there, I'm t using just the very tip of the blade and twisting it. Uh, can I recommend any good books? Oh my gosh, guys, I just read this book. I actually made a post about it, but it's good enough that I'm going to say it here too. There's this book called Lab Girl by this woman named Hope Jaron, who's a, a botanist, a paleobotanist. She does essentially carbon isotope dating of ancient soils to determine using the carbon isotope within the plant carbon that exists in the soil, what was going on with the planet back then, uh, back when that plant was alive. I think that's the gist of it. At any rate, this book, Lab Girl, is her memoir, and it's amazing. And particularly for people like us who geek out about, you know, the particulars of a tree and how the tree lived and, you know, man, the way she writes about trees, her whole thing throughout her career has been to try and educate people or understand a worldview, her sense is that trees are a lot more like people than we like to think. Even though they might not be sentient, they are governed by similar biological and physical realities. Um, and she does a marvelous job in this book of juggling back and forth between her own life and, and sort of stuff about trees and using the stuff about trees as metaphors for her own life. And it's really, really well done. Um, and I, and I loved it. So I can't recommend that one highly enough. Uh, the other book I would recommend is, oh, what is it called? Um, the Art of Whittling by Nicholas Carlson. Um, uh, I thought to myself, do I really need to read another book about spoon carving? Um, I have never read a uh, Willie Sundquist's book, uh, but I have um, E.J. Osborne's book, Hatchet and Bear's Guide to Spoon Carving, and I have Warren Calder's book, Spawn, um, or Spoon, depending on which edition you got. Um, okay, so now, I'm gonna continue that thought in a second. So now, that I have the outline basically the way I want it. I'm going to redefine the rim using the limitations of how far I had to carve back here. Uh, am I talking about the ecology of a cracker childhood? No, is that another book from her? Uh, no, she well, she grew up in uh, Minnesota, I want to say. Um, uh, 
so I would say the, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, about the art of whittling. So now I'm carving the top rim. Uh, I just really, really appreciate Nicholas's um, approach to talking about carving. It just it talked about growing up and whittling as he grew up and I don't know, it just, it made the whole process seem very approachable, not in a, and very approachable as like something that we all get to have a very personal relationship with in our lives. Um, uh, which the other books do as well, but there was something about this one. I just really loved it. I mean, I love the other ones too, but, but, uh, I forget, maybe I read, I think I just read enough on Amazon where it lets you read a little bit. Um, and, uh, and I just was so impressed that I got it and I ended up reading it in, in, you know, three hours. I just whipped right through it. Have I seen Lost Art Press bring out another Willie Sinquist book? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, but, uh. But that sounds good. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I've never gotten a chance to see the Swedish spoon carving. I think that they've, since I started carving, they came out with another edition. But back when I started carving, the only thing you could get was a used edition that was like 140 bucks. And I thought, mm, nope. Um, and then since then, they've come out with a, you know, a reasonably priced one. But I, I never, never sprung on it. But, um... Yeah, it's a tricky thing uh, reading about something that you love so much. And it's, <laughs> you know, I've been writing this book um, the last couple of months. Very exciting. It's, uh, it's a book that uses my farm and my experience carving spoons to talk about how to, essentially, how to, how to build a, a living off of whatever land you happen to have. So not necessarily doing exactly the way I did, but what are the underlying commonalities of how to think about it? So now I'm just matching up the width here. Um, I forget the author's name. She talks a lot about Longleaf Pines, beautiful storytelling. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that was her. She did teach in Atlanta, but... Um, hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, she did teach in Atlanta, but I don't think... She definitely didn't grow up in the South, so it might not be her. Either way, that sounds like a good one, too. Um, send that to me in a direct message there, would you? So I remember what you said about it. Um, I'm trying to say, oh, it's just, it's, you know, it's, this is a difficult thing to convey not just how to do something, but why you love it and convey it in a way so that other people feel empowered to try it. That is, it's hard. To do that and I was very impressed with how Nicholas did that so um, I think his if you guys don't follow him his handle is a, a hard sloyd life and um, yeah of all the spoon carvers out there he's the one I at least right now possibly because I read this book I feel the most kinship with because our you know we're both putting the kids on the school bus and then sitting around the kitchen carving spoons for a living um, during the day and uh, <laughs> there aren't that many of us in the world doing that so I feel a bond with this guy um, in, in both the, the spoon carving and the and the you know the fitting that in with the family life um, so um, right, so now I'm refining the handle to be the same size and I'm checking on the side constantly to make sure that front and back it's about where I want it and also that I'm not wandering one way or the other in terms of having the bowl be centered I want the bowl to stay centered and guys it looks like I'm gonna have to stop this video in a few minutes um, or it's gonna stop itself at some random time maybe I'll just let it do that and I will do a better job of I will do a better job of um, getting this one saved so that I can post it to the YouTube channel, which is just my name.
If you search Emma Van Dreisch on YouTube, it's the only thing on it is when I have been doing this and I get my act together and I'm good about uploading it, that's where it goes. So you can check it out. Um, okay, so now the top room is where I want it. The handle dimensions are where I want it. Let me see about trimming this handle down. Now it looks like the I could I still need to remove some from the from the rim. You can see that well you can't really see with this because of how it is, but trust me, when I look at it, I can see that there's just a little bit that needs to be removed from around this. Um, but in terms of the neck, those are spot on. Pretty close to spot on, and the roundness is good. Um, so now I'm just going to trim the end. Okay. There. And this time, because I know what form I'm going for, I'm not going to do what I did the last time, but I'm just going to go straight for that sort of barrel vault style top that I did on the other one. And then just a bevel on each side. Good. That. And like that. Okay. So now, um, yeah, yeah, this spoon uh, saved quite nicely. Um, yeah, here I can just. Move that last bit. Good. We're good. Um, so now I'm going to carve uh, around this circle one last time and bring it down to what will be its final dimensions. Um, and final curve. Um, So as I draw this outline with the pencil, I'm trying to be aware of smoothing out any bumps in the outline that's there and also keeping it symmetrical with the handle and where that is. So sometimes it can be useful to take a moment beforehand and just uh, look at the thing as a whole figure out you know where you're gonna come real close to the existing edge and where you're gonna be far away from it but you can see that just about does the trick um, for all of those of you just joining uh, we're almost at the end of the time here so it's gonna end pretty soon and when it does I'll do better job than the last time of uh, uploading it to YouTube um, so that you can see the the bowl of the previous set of salad servers and finishing that off and then the getting almost to the point of finishing this one that's going to have the little teeth and then I'll, I'll post a picture of it so you can see what it looks like at the end okay so yeah and I will say about that crack there had I seen that crack in the in the spoon blank I would not have pursued that spoon blank um, I try hard to walk away from a situation as soon as it looks like it might not work out so that I don't invest more and more time and then I reach a point where I I have to try really hard to save it um, which in this case it worked out but if it didn't work out then that would have been you know 20 minutes of work as opposed to 5 minutes of work um, so that's an important thing is to be able to walk away early on to fail quickly rather than fail at the last minute anybody have any questions before uh, this whole thing stops I don't know when I can do my next uh 
live session probably sometime next week. But uh, it won't be tomorrow, that's for sure. Doesn't have to be related to this, it could be related to anything. And remember to tell your TV producer executive friends that if anyone wants to do a Bob Ross style spoon carving with Emmett TV show, I am entirely at my leisure. I suppose in this day and age it would have to be interactive. And that's how it would work. Okay. Now I've got my fresh outline. Crank is the way I want it. Dimensions of the handle are the way I want it. Now I'm just going to re-carve the curve of the rim one last time so I know exactly how far up to pull stuff from the bottom. And again, working hard to make sure that the rim swoops down low enough here and doesn't have a bit here. The new puppy is a black lab mix. Her mom is a black lab, they want to say black lab terrier mix, although they don't know. Um, I saw a picture of her and she looks an awful lot like our dog that passed away this fall. Uh, so, and then her dad is a black lab. So I think she's gonna be like medium size, she is so sweet and just the right degree of meekness and not being overly submissive um, for, for our taste and our, our needs. She had a brother that was much mm, feistier, couldn't stop barking, couldn't stop jumping up on, on us when we were testing her and her brother. And uh, thankfully she was not like that. Okay, so now that the rim is the way I want it, the image show, exactly. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, clean up the back of the bowl in this instance because that's the limiting factor with that save that had to happen. So I'll do the back of the bowl first, matching the details to what happened here where I pulled it as far into the rim as I could, which I don't always do. There's a video on YouTube from yesterday of three different serving spoons that I carved yesterday and each one does this shoulder transition differently and I go through them, just a short little video because um, I wanted to share. It's not every day that I have three spoons that do it sort of look so similar from the top and yet do such different things on the sides. Um, I'm gonna do the back here just to get that exactly the way it needs to be. And then spread those curves up and around. Just like that, good. Alright. This side. Make sure that stays lined up. Right. Pushing the shoulder right down to the rim. Using doing all these cuts right with the tip of my knife. Um, I do more with this bit of my knife than anything else. Um, and yet I find the 106 is more useful than the 120 because uh, I like being able to start here and have a long pivot cut at the same time. So I do everything with a 106 blade. I don't use a 120, um, but a lot of the work that I do is choked right up using the tip of the knife. Excuse me. And then making sure that the curvature coming up to that rim is just so. Okay, good. Push it down a little more there. Now, if I was doing something other than a salad server, I might approach this rim differently. Remember, the salad server, I want it to be as thin a rim as possible. Oh, I have 18 seconds remaining. Um, but with other spoons, you do different things. So, all right, 10 seconds, guys. Thank you so much. I will do what I can to get this up on YouTube. Um, and I'll uh, post a picture of the finished salad servers in a minute. I'll get them done.